Ebert is the same simple design as the public laboratory spectrometers. It has an entrance slit, a direct path to a transmission diffraction grating, and a camera to capture images of the diffraction pattern. This version is not connected to the internet, so you have to capture still images and upload them to spectralworkbench.org for analysis. But that means that this spectrometer is completely portable. Although this is a simple design, it has two sets of features which make it a little bit harder to build than the public laboratory versions. First, both the angle of the grating and the angle of the camera can be adjusted. Not because they need to be adjusted a lot, but so they can be adjusted once after the whole thing is built to the precise angles that produce the sharpest spectra. Set it and forget it. What? Second, the point-and-shoot camera can be powered on and off, and you can get to the battery or the SD card without moving the camera, which means the calibration of the spectrometer can be maintained even if the camera powers down or you need to get to the battery or the SD card. So you can calibrate and then take it on a date. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. I spent less than $10 on materials to make this, but I already had a lot of the stuff lying around, of course the camera, and a lot of the materials. The black tube, which extends the distance between the entrance slit and the grating, is part of a vacuum cleaner wand. The slit is made from a couple of rusty box cutter blades, which are attached to this cap-like thing I found, which covers the end of the tube. The problem with plastic tubes is that even dark, dirty ones reflect a lot of light at low angles. So I decided to try to line the tube with black felt. I coated the inside of the tube with spray adhesive, let it get tacky, then tried to insert the wound up felt which worked, but only after it was wearing a Tyvek condom. By the time the felt was all spread out and glued to the inside of the tube, it was a fuzz disaster. I eventually decided that I had to get the fuzz wet to mat it down, and soaked it with concentrated liquid starch. But where I couldn't reach it from the end, it would not stay matted down. So I resorted to the old bike inner tube trick, which worked. The starch had become tacky by this time, and I only kept the inner tube in for about 10 minutes. And then let the vacuum cleaner tube drip dry by the wood stove overnight. There were a few remaining fuzzies, but they were easy to scorch away. It's possible that this technique could replace the starch step, but that does nothing to justify saving old bike inner tubes. Okay, hoarders one, stray light zero. I have no idea what this little doohickey is that I found on my workbench. And I hope I never find out, because with a little whittling it fit perfectly on the end of the newly felted tube. I took the Dremel tool to the box cutter blades and soon had a reasonably adjustable entrance slit. I've had this holographic diffraction grating film for years, but I had to buy this 3 quarter inch PVC conduit body, which makes a perfect housing for the grating. I have a selection of Canon power shots, and to make a plate to connect the camera to the grating housing, a junked power supply cage from an old PC was called back into action. By putting the grating in its own housing, I could make it easily adjustable. Here's how the camera and the housing will line up on the metal plate. I had to make a new viewport into the grating housing, and the soft PVC made this easy for Dr. Dremel. Dr. Dremel was also enlisted to create a little grating holder with a nice right angle bend from the edge of the power supply cage. This would hold the grating solidly to the bottom of the conduit body, but also allow it to be rotated to the optimum angle. To connect the conduit body to the entrance slit tube, I used half of a PVC 45 degree connector. This was epoxied to the conduit body. I also added little PVC feet to align the new viewport with the height of the power shot lens. A little whittling of the PVC connector allowed for a secure fit of the entrance slit tube. I bought a square yard of black felt at a craft store. This lines the entrance slit tube and also the grating housing. I sprayed a little flat black paint into the housing first because I thought it would be hard to line all the little corners with felt, but it turned out to be really easy to cut pieces of felt and cover everything, so the paint was unnecessary.
The final piece is the plate that holds the camera in front of the viewport. I incorporated one of the right angle lips, which will be used to align the camera. I folded over a strip along the edge for extra rigidity. The plate has oversized holes for the screws that go into the PVC feet of the grating housing, so the angle between the camera and the grating housing can be fine-tuned. A Brooks's camera keeper holds the camera firmly against the lip on the metal plate, so whenever the camera is mounted, it's in the correct position. And it's all done. The dimensions and angles I used for the spectrometer came from observations I made on the SpectroBench 2000 optical bench. The distance between the entrance slit and the grating is 30 centimeters, and after I rotated the grating to get the sharpest spectral image, it was 49 degrees from perpendicular to the light path from the slit. The camera is pointed 9 degrees to the right of perpendicular with the grating. These numbers could change as I try to get good images. But here's the first calibration spectrum from a compact fluorescent lamp. It's certainly better than my last spectrometer. Time to hit the bars and start racking up the elements in neon beer signs. So now, these guys are our bitches. <laughs>